Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Gordon, the Managing Editor and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Welcome to today's discussion, Fast Reactors, the Versatile Test Reactor, and Nuclear Safety and Non-Proliferation. A few notes before we get started. This event is on the record and we are live streaming to Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We encourage you to post about today's discussion and to share on social media using the hashtag AC Energy and tagging us at, at AC Global Energy. Those of you who are participating on Zoom may submit questions in the Q&A portal located at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the event, and I will try to get to as many as we can. We are honored to have Ambassador Thomas Graham Jr. here with us today to deliver welcome remarks. Tom is the architect of the Non-Proliferation Treaties Extension, and he is a fierce advocate for the peaceful use of nuclear energy and the recognition that nuclear power is a key tool in the fight against climate change. Tom is the chairman of the board of Lightbridge Corporation, and he is the co-chairman of the Atlantic Council's Nuclear Energy and National Security Coalition, where I've had the privilege of working with him for the last two years. Tom, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer, um, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for having us all here today. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about climate change, which I believe is the most pressing issue of our time. And I'd like to talk about the role of nuclear power. Nuclear energy, in my opinion, is the only energy source that can provide clean, reliable, base load energy 24 seven in the US and globally. Nuclear energy can power cities and the industrial se sector, guaranteeing reliable electricity and providing clean water and the promise of a better quality of life for all. Nuclear energy is a crucial tool in the existential fight against climate change, making it so that we do not need to give up modernity in order to save the climate and the world. However, it is essential that the US, along with allies, reestablish itself as the global leader in the geopolitical race to corner the global market on nuclear energy with large and specifically in the, uh, in the deployment of the next generation of nuclear energy technologies. Not only must the US and our allies be the ones who establish century long relationships with purchasing companies, countries, but we must ensure that the new nuclear build adhere to the highest standards of safety and non-proliferation. I have devoted my life's work to non-proliferation and the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. From 1970 to 1997, I worked on behalf of the US government on every major international arms control and non-proliferation negotiation in which the US took part, thereby helping to establish international trust in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. I played an integral role in the 1955 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Extension, which is, which treaty is the most important remaining major nuclear arms control agreement. The NPT and its mandatory safeguards, a system of International Atomic Energy Agency inspection and verification, ensuring the peaceful uses of nuclear energy provides this the explicit legal right to nuclear power to all NPT parties. It is within this context that I wholeheartedly support nuclear energy technologies, including technologies like the versatile test reactor that will support the demonstration, commercialization, and continuous improvement of new types of nuclear fuel and materials, 
that can power a decarbonized world. I'm greatly looking forward to this conversation. And with that, I'd like to turn this discussion back to Jennifer. Tom, thank you so much um, for your remarks and for framing for us why nuclear energy from the existing reactor fleets to innovative nuclear technologies are so critical and so crucial in the fight against climate change. And I think we also understand, again, from your remarks, why it's essential that the United States establish itself as the global leader in advanced civil nuclear exports, both in terms of geopolitical competition with Russia and China, and also to ensure that international nuclear energy projects adhere to the highest standards of safety and non-proliferation. So with that, I would like to begin today's discussion about the role of the versatile test reactor, the VTR, in advancing the new reactor technologies that are needed in the fight against climate change and that are also needed to compete in the global market. I'm delighted to introduce today's panelists. Ambassador Laura Holgate, who is the Vice President for Materials Risk Management at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Jackie Kemper, Director of Government Affairs at OCLO and also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Ken Luongo, President for Partnership for Global Security. And Dr. Kamal Pasha Mehmetolu, who is the Executive Director for the Versatile Test Reactor Project at Idaho National Laboratory. So Ken, I would like to start with you and I'd like to remain with the big picture that Tom provided for us um, for just one more moment. So Ken, could you speak to the role of nuclear energy and especially advanced nuclear technologies in getting to net zero by 2050? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Jennifer, and uh, thanks to Tom for, uh, for that great introduction. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I think really the, the most essential item here in the zero carbon race as it relates to nuclear power is to get the framing of the role of the technology uh, correct, both in the domestic and the international uh, context. I really strongly believe that the Cold War framing of the nuclear energy value is now obsolete, given the modern challenges that we now face. Uh, and I think there are th obviously three core rationales for why nuclear matters in a different way and needs to be framed in a different way today than it has been in the, in the past. The first, as Tom alluded to, clean energy. Uh, it's a major challenge to get to zero carbon by 2050. We're already at 2021, you know, almost to 2022. Second, as you mentioned, Jennifer, geopolitical competitiveness, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and Russia. And in third, commercialization of these next generation technologies as, in my opinion, a necessary element in the strengthening of the nuclear governance system and the um, prevention of proliferation. So I'll just walk through those three things, those three core items very briefly. On clean energy, there's really four essential facts. The IPCC has said we need more nuclear energy in order to meet our zero carbon objectives. The International Energy Agency has made clear that nuclear energy has a very important role in reaching zero carbon. The Biden administration has embraced both existing and next generation reactors as an element in its suite of clean energy technologies. And then uh, interestingly and recently, reluctant nations that have been wary of nuclear power, including Japan and South Korea, um, have been exploring much more intensively the role of next generation technologies in their zero carbon uh, suite of technologies. And that was evidenced by the recent um, Biden um, summits with both the leaders of South Korea and, and, uh, and Japan. On the issue of international competitiveness, I think it's really important to understand that at this moment, the United States does not control the uh, manufacturing um, or the technology development of any of the major clean energy technologies. China is overwhelmingly the leader in solar power. Uh, Europe and China are the leaders in wind power. China dominates the strategic materials that are required for um, renewable energy and for other electric vehicles and things like that. And Russia and China are currently dominating the building and the export of large nuclear reactors. So where does that leave us? What's up for grabs for the United States moving forward is next generation nuclear 
and clean um, and carbon capture uh, and, uh, and storage. And to lose those two markets, I think, would be a significant blow to the country. So the next generation market is not just domestic. A lot of people have been talking about what the role is in the United States, but it also is related to exports and particularly to developing economy nations, many of which have limited um, nuclear experience. And that leads to the final issue, which is commercialization. Why is commercialization so critical? Historically, the leading nations in nuclear export have had the most control over nuclear governance and the evolution of that system. So with advanced reactors, there are definitely going to be changes that are going to be required in the nuclear governance system for safeguards, for security, um, and uh, for the U.S. to have significant influence over those, the evolution of that system so that it's maximally effective. It has to be an active competitor in the nuclear export market. Strong governance of these new technologies and supporting the necessary infrastructure in these newcomer nuclear nations is essential to prevent proliferation, support zero carbon energy, and protect international security. And thank you so much. Um, I want to go, Laura, to you. Um, climate change and nuclear weapons are perhaps the two greatest existential threats that humanity faces in the 21st century. So if you could, could you please speak to your support for advanced nuclear technologies and how you think that they might address security and non-proliferation concerns? And Laura, I think you might be on mute. The most important aspect of this is that we have a chance with these, this generation of reactors, this fourth generation, to really build in nuclear security and other non-proliferation aspects such as safeguards uh, and uh, other elements from the get-go. The, the generation of reactors that is currently deployed, uh, you know, almost 500 of them around the world, generation three or three and a half, uh, were, their basics were conceived before we understood a lot of what we understand now about proliferation, about security, um, you know, before Three Mile Island, before the India and Pakistani uh, nuclearization, a uh, nuclear weaponization before 9-11. And so the steps that have been designed to manage the risks of those reactors and the fuel cycles that are associated with them have been kind of glued on over time. Um, and so the, there's a perception that addressing the security and proliferation risks of, of, of nuclear reactors are expensive. Well, they're expensive if they're afterthoughts. They don't have to be expensive if they are part of the design. And so we have with generation four with advanced reactors to bake in the recognition and the understandings we have about current technology, about how that technology can be used for good, but also how it can be misused and to uh, really take at the design level ways to make it uh, harder for malicious actors to obtain nuclear material, ways to limit the, the, the problematic, uh, the, the danger or the risks associated with nuclear material, ways to make these new reactors more easily safeguarded. And these are going to be different, as Ken pointed out, from what the from the mechanisms and rules and governance structures that we already have. Uh, so we we need to be developing those structures uh, and those governance uh, understandings and, and adaptations at the same time as we're developing the reactors, so that the reactors can design in. Uh, to those concerns and, and those opportunities. So my first, uh, my first reaction, or my first point in, in this regard is that uh, these new reactors have give us a an opportunity to address technically uh, aspects that have been hard to address in the past, or at least expensive and time consuming. But the other piece is, the, is also to echo and build on what, what Ken said about geopolitics and that the, these reactors are going to require a revision of some of the approaches that we take to safeguarding and securing 
nuclear materials and facilities, and also to think about the globalization of the fuel cycle. Right now, we have a fairly well-structured, well-understood, reliable uh, global fuel cycle for taking uranium ore out of the ground and taking it to all the stages that need to turn it into fuel for reactors. We don't have that global fuel cycle for the new fuel types that some of these new reactors are gonna be required, uh, are requiring, whether it's uh, high assay, low enriched uranium or other novel forms of fuel. And so there's a, we, we have a lot of governance updating to do to think about uh, how, what are the, what are the non-proliferation and security guardrails we need to put around these reactors as they are exported uh, because I agree with Ken 100%. In fact, I think it's even more the case that, at the, that advanced reactors are, are uh, applicable to uses outside the United States. There's a, a few uses in the U.S., but especially where we're talking about countries with zero to low nuclear uh, experience and, and expertise, with, uh, where there's a, a weak or a diverse or, or a distributed grid, uh, or other uh, or, or financial constraints that make a large gigawatt scale reactor inappropriate. Um, we, we really need to be thinking about what are the export conditions uh, for these reactors from a security and non-proliferation point of view and how that relates to the new fuel types, to the portability and the, the additional changes that uh, or differences that come with these advanced reactors. But we can do that because we're at the front of that process. And I have confidence that uh, a combination of educated and engaged uh, developer community, along with uh, intentional and uh, coordinated government activity can get us uh, to a place where these reactors actually create benefits for nonproliferation and uh, for national security. Laura, thank you so much. And I think we've really, you know, at this point, established the need for advanced nuclear technologies, both in the United States um, and also globally, as you said. So, Kamal, I'd like to talk to turn to you. Um, and please, if you would talk about the role that the VTR as a test reactor is playing in supporting the licensing and continued research and development of commercial civil nuclear technologies. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, VTR, uh, let me give you a uh, very high level in a nutshell, what BTR really is. It is a test reactor uh, that produces high intensity of neutrons. Um, and those neutrons are used for testing new fuels, uh, materials, uh, instrumentations, and uh, sensors that uh, these advanced reactors uh, are looking for uh, in, the, in the future. It is. Uh, it can simulate different coolant environments so that uh, we can cover the spectrum of advanced reactors that uh, people are considering deploying. And uh, we can also, uh, to Laura's point, uh, I think VTR will also be a very good uh, test bed for other types of uh, in-core instrumentations and sensors, especially those uh, that are uh, related to safeguards by design or security by design concepts that the advanced reactor community may be contemplating to implement into their designs in the in the future. Now, uh, to look at the, uh, what, what's the role of a test reactor uh, in this environment where we are trying to get to a, a decarbonized uh, future with a variety of different reactor types, uh, we just need to look at the history of what we did with the light water reactors, how we were able to achieve not only the technology leadership in that area, but we have been uh, continuously innovating uh, that technology. And uh, we started light water reactors in the 1960s. Uh, I, I think the rest of the panelists uh, are too young to remember those days, but we, we, we started with the 60 plus percent availability of those reactors. Today, we are talking about 92 plus percent availability of those reactors. And most of that was due to a lot of the testing that we have done 
in reactors like the advanced test reactor and similar reactors where we improve the materials and the fuels and the and the instruments so uh, i believe what btr is going to do in the advanced reactor tech uh, area is exactly the same thing for 60 years it will come it will be uh, part of the engine to for continuous innovations for those uh, especially advanced reactors but uh, even uh, some reactor designs that we know of today, which can be improved in the future uh, as we move forward. Uh, I believe that if we are going to achieve the clean energy goals, uh, as well as the US leadership in that area, there are three elements uh, that are essential. We need to have a very strong commercial sector that's uh, designing and deploying uh, reactors. We need to have a very robust regulatory system that can license those reactors. And we need to have a very robust R&D infrastructure that can underpin all those and support uh, both the de developers as well as the regulators as we move forward. And VTR will, remain, uh, will fill the remaining gap in that R&D infrastructure by providing the missing element, which is high energy, high flux neutron environment for testing all these new concepts in an accelerated fashion. Thank you, Kamal. And Jackie, I want to go to you um, to give us a little bit of the industry perspective. So speaking, you know, on behalf of Oklo, how does Oklo view the significance of testing at the VTR? Um, and how does the VTR support all fast reactor designs, especially if one of them were, for example, to have a demonstration reactor operating before the VTR? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so first and foremost, you know, we we absolutely do, um, you know, we need a, a fast neutron test facility in, in this country. Um, and, you know, for from Oklo's perspective and industry perspective, I think, and, and Kamal touched on this a little bit, um, you know, one of the reasons that Oklo is able to move quickly um, is because of the lessons learned from other test reactors that have come before, um, like EBR2. Um, and so advanced reactor designs like ours and the ones we are seeing move towards demonstration and deployment over the next decade are really, in a lot of ways, based on the ideas, concepts, developments, and technical approaches that reach back to the test reactors that we've built in this country and operated in this country over the past, you know, 60 to 70 years. Um, and so for us as a company, um, you know, this, first of all, VTR could, would be extremely helpful for us um, for things like improving our fuel um, and technologies in, you know, the third and fourth generation designs um, from, from Oklo. And, and to the other piece of your question, VTR would be a resource for everyone, right? Not just uh, not just fast reactors. Um, to to look at you know high performance capabilities for fuel and materials to really enhance performance, and of course reduce cost. Um, and so we can commercialize, you know, as an example, commercialize and develop a whole new class of alloys um, as an example of materials improvement. Um, and so for Oklo, we will be able to do tests that would allow us to, you know, for example, extend fuel lifetimes and operating temperature limits um, if we were to have access to, to that complete and operational VTR. Um, and so, you know, would the VTR have an impact on our first Aurora right now? Um, not really where we sort of are in that process. Um, but again, I just want to sort of highlight and sort of amplify something that Kamal said, you know, but guess what did have an impact? on on this first design um, and that's those previous research reactors so we need the vtr so that we can have future oclos right and other advanced reactor developers building off of the lessons learned from new r d that we get from this uh this new facility um yeah thank you jackie and so i want to go now to talking a little bit about the driver fuel so the fuel that powers the vtr which is a metallic fuel alloy of 70% uranium, 20% plutonium, and 10% zirconium. So Kamal, if I can go back to you, um, could you address the need for plutonium and also talk a little bit about the idea that the VTR would actually be consuming more plutonium than it produces? 
Certainly, uh, Jennifer. Thanks for the question. Now let's uh, let's start with why we why we uh, why are we using plutonium for the reactor? It, uh, like any other test reactor, our design objective is to get a very high neutron floods over a large enough volume to be prototypic, while minimizing the size of the core. We don't want to make this reactor too big. It's not practical to operate a test reactor. So to achieve those objectives and taking advantage of the fact that uh, plutonium uh, gives us more fissile materials, uh, higher density fissile materials, and also gives more neutrons per fission, uh, we take advantage of that to get the high neutron fluxes uh, with as small a uh, reactor as we can get, we can design. And that's about 300 megawatts for VTR. Now, uh, where's the plutonium coming from? Uh, the plutonium that VTR plans to use is uh, existing stockpile uh, plutonium. We do not, uh, the design does not include any new separations or creation of any new plutonium. Uh, and it does not include any recycling of plutonium that comes out of uh, VTR. We would like to use the existing stockpiles uh, hopefully the weapons grade uh, stockpile because that gives us more fissile materials uh, so we get more uh, we, got, uh, we get more neutrons uh, out of it and use it in a one true circle and by the when, uh, when the fuel comes out of the reactor it has less plutonium than the fresh fuel so it burns some of it and it also denatures the isotopics of the plutonium so that uh, the plutonium that remains in the used fuel or spent fuel is not attractive for uh, weapons purposes. Uh, we are talking about, uh, for the lifetime of the reactor, we are talking about 30 metric tons of plutonium. Uh, we have that in the United States. Uh, in terms of surplus plutonium. And, and when we start looking at uh, international sources, uh, there are other sources out there that do, they already have separated plutonium in stockpile. So uh, that material exists. Uh, but also another thing I wanna, uh, I wanna make sure it is, uh, it is clear is that we don't have to use that much plutonium. We can get away with less plutonium if that is the direction we go, if uh, we have a commercial supply of high SALEU. We always need plutonium with the 300 megawatt reactor, but if we have high SALEU uh, uh, commercially available, we can use that with, uh, with uh, with uh, some uh, less plutonium instead of 20%, perhaps closer to 10% plutonium and still get the same performance, but that does uh, reduce the need for plutonium over the lifetime of the reactor. Uh, I, uh, I hope that answered the uh, question, uh, Jennifer, on why and uh, where is that plutonium coming from. But the big message is we are not creating any new plutonium by using VTR. We are actually getting rid of the existing plutonium by using VTR. Thank you, Kamal. And that's really a distinction I think that I want to stay with um, for the next portion of this conversation. So we're going to come back to that as well. But um, for right now, Ken, I want to go to you because I know that you're very familiar with the environmental impact study for the VTR. And of course, you're an expert on nonproliferation issues as well. So what is your initial takeaway on the safety of the VTR's fuel and the use of the VTR to dispose of weapons grade plutonium? Uh, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Jennifer. Um, I think the most, you know, to pick up on Kamal's point, I think the most important point to be made about a VTR is that it is not the resurrection of the EBR2. In other words, it is not designed to breed plutonium. Uh, the DOE EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement for the reactor, specifically states that the reactor will be used as a plutonium burner, not a breeder. Um, I'm not technically adept the way Kamal is, but my understanding is that any decision to reconfigure the reactor from a burner to a breeder would require reanalysis and certification of the reactor's parameters. Um, 
And I think from a political standpoint, it also would create a backlash. So if it were to be a breeder, I'm not even certain, and Kamal certainly could talk to this, that it would be able to meet that neutron flux issue, which is so important for the testing. So um, from a policy perspective, it clearly, VTR's use of planned use of plutonium in the fuel is problematic, certainly from a perception standpoint. Um, the U.S. has spent a lot of time trying to discourage countries from using fissile materials in commercial and research reactors. That being said, I think there are three mitigating elements that need to be considered. And just to take a step back, this whole new era of nuclear is a balancing act between climate and other international security objectives. So to tilt um, entirely one way or to tilt entirely the other way, I think is a fundamental uh, mistake. We need high standards and to have high standards, you need to be in the game. But let me just talk about, um, about three of the reasons why. One, obviously we have to be a competitor in the market and this reactor, from what I understand from the companies and from uh, the people that are involved in the program, like Kamal, is this is the kind of test reactor that you need to qualify new fuels and to test out new sensors in highly radioactive environments, et cetera, et cetera. All of that exceeds my technical capability. So I take at face value that that's essential to the, to the companies. But I do think there are two other issues which were important, which, which um, both you, Jennifer, and Kamal alluded to. And that is, if in fact this reactor is going to use the excess plutonium that was declared excess under the US-Russian uh, agreement from the 1990s, that makes a difference. We were willing and ready to use that plutonium in mixed oxide fuels uh, in commercial reactors in order to dispose of it. So this is a different version uh, of that. I think the second important point is that there won't be a reprocessing of the spent fuel uh, in my understanding, and that it would be ultimately put in dry casts after some, some treatment element of the fuel because it's in sodium. Uh, and so um, to me, I think there are three red lines for the VTR that we should that we should adhere to and, and that the government should give some thought to putting into the program. One, no conversion to a breeder reactor. If it's a burner and a test reactor, then don't convert it. Two, no reprocessing of the spent fuel to separate out the plutonium. And three, no use of the VTR to support US or allied nation breeder reactor programs or technologies. I think that the, this is gonna be on a US government reservation. You're not gonna have international safeguards, but you have a very, very highly qualified laboratory infrastructure of people that understand the safety and security and safeguards elements for this kind of a reactor. And I think the burning of that plutonium uh, and the contribution it makes to the 1990 agreement is a very important uh, step forward since we were willing to do that uh, to begin with. Thank you, Ken. And I want to stay again with this distinction between burner reactors and breeder reactors. And Laura, I want to go to you. Um, separately from the VTR, what are the potential concerns with a fast breeder reactor? And you know, what are just some more of these issues that you're thinking through, um, again, from a non-proliferation standpoint? Well, the, obviously the concern about a breeder reactor is that it makes more plutonium. Um, than it consumes. We today in the in the global environment, we have vastly more plutonium uh, that's already been separated, whether it's uh, coming out of weapons as the material that uh, Kamal was talking about, or whether it's been separated in the context of, you know, misguided old fashioned efforts to close the fuel cycle uh, in a light water reactor format. There is no uh, effort to do that that has not resulted in, in tons of separated plutonium in Russia, in Japan, in France, and in the UK uh, that has no, destination, uh, no disposition path. So 
Um, the notion that the world needs more plutonium uh, is a dangerous one and it's factually uh, counterindicated. So any kind, any breeder reactor uh, is is going to only make that problem worse. Uh, any value that can come from plutonium that from those who advocate that there is value there, there is plenty of existing plutonium from which that can be uh, that can be achieved. So I think that's um, that's an important component. Uh, I think Ken's red lines were absolutely correct. And as the uh, the mother of the MOX program uh, back in the day for plutonium disposition. I certainly share his view that uh, there's very little uh, distinction to um, policy distinction in using plutonium to make energy through MOX in a light water reactor as the previous technology was planning to or using that plutonium to create neutrons in support of peaceful nuclear research and development. I think that's a policy wash. The, but, what I, but I would add a fourth red line because sadly many of us are veterans of the Department of Energy or are familiar with its trajectory and its ability to build and complete big uh, programs such as the VTR is questionable. And in fact, that's why the MOX uh, technology fell apart ultimately is because the facility to build it, to, to build MOX fuel could not be uh, completed in, in a reasonable time for a reasonable cost. So uh, I think because we don't know for sure whether or not there's ongoing uh, congressional support uh, for the funding much beyond, you know, to, to design and then build and then operate this facility over decades, um, we can't delay on the current technology for disposal of excess plutonium in the dilute and dispose uh, project. And I think that needs to be a fourth line is non-interference with dilute and dispose until the time that it is absolutely certain that there will be a VTR and that it will operate uh, on the material. Now the dilute and dispose program is gonna take long enough that there will still be uh, weapons grade material uh, at a, you know at some point when the VTR is scheduled and you know even beyond schedule might actually come into operation. So this is not an either or, but I think it's critical that we not uh, introduce any new um, uncertainty into the disposition path for U.S. Uh, plutonium. Um, the other thing I would say uh, to the points that everyone ha has already made about the, the non-proliferation guardrails, I would add a couple more. Um, first of all, I, I would suggest that it would be important that the U.S. also make, in addition to supporting our own uh, reactor developer community, that we make the reactor available for international research purposes and that we invite uh, international researchers to, to work and do their experiments at the reactor. One of the reasons we're building this reactor is because there are so few sources of high energy neutrons around the world. And so we ought to be contributing to that, thereby preventing the development uh, of additional uh, reactors that, that might lack some of the non-proliferation guardrails that we're willing to put around it. Um, the, the, the other point would be to include the reactor and any associated fuel cycle facilities in the U.S. voluntary offer agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency for potential application of international safeguards. The IAEA could benefit in its development of safeguards for, our new, for these new reactor technologies, the advanced reactor, by having access to the VTR. And so uh, to test out some of those uh, tech, uh, those uh, safeguards efforts. And so creating this as an international research tool in support of nonproliferation uh, goals, I think are other important components of mitigating against and managing the risk uh, that, that this, uh, it, you know, any use of plutonium poses. Laura, thank you. And thank you also for raising um, the question of international cooperation. And I want to come back to that in a moment as well. Um, but first, Jackie, I want to go to you again, speaking from Oklo's perspective. How do you think through these non-proliferation issues and how do you work to address them um, as a fast reactor company? 
Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so just to start, um, before I came to Oaklo, um, in my previous role with Third Way, um, one of the ways that I actually got to know Caroline Cochran and Jacob DeWitt from, from o- the, the co-founders of Oaklo was through um, a project that Laura Holgate and myself were working on in sort of bringing advanced reactor developers together with the non-proliferation safeguards and security communities for the first for the first time, really, in a lot of ways, um, not always for the first time, but there were certainly new pathways for engagement that we were forging. Um, and I can say from that experience that um, Oakland is a shining example of this. The interest from the advanced reactor developer community in, um, as Laura mentioned, sort of looking at how in this early phase to bake in and look at um, safeguards and security by design, look at um, you know, engaging with non-proliferation experts on what it's going to, things they need to be considering as they look to eventually export these technologies um, was incredibly high. I mean, the interest was immediate. Um, and, you know, just over the past, I would say three years, I've been incredibly encouraged um, by sort of the willingness to engage um, on, a, on a steady basis. And I think we've seen results of that. Um, both in industry and in our own government. Um, we've certainly seen um, NNSA really start to, to boost their engagement in this space, uh, particularly the um, Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation Office. We've hosted a few convenings with them in the past, um, bringing these folks together. So I think what we're seeing happen is the, the interest level from the advanced reactor developers um, and the motivation to think about things like non-proliferation security and safeguards now um, is in in part driven by cost, as Laura mentioned, because at the end of the day, if we are thinking about these things at the front end of this process, we aren't going to be stuck with the price tag at the back end. Um, and so that makes it that makes a huge difference. Um, and in line with that, what we're finally starting to see catch up are the resources that are available. Um, for us, for us at Oaklo, for other companies. Um, we've seen GAIN, the Gateway for Acceleration and Innovation in Nuclear, um, and NNSA partner together. There's more working groups. So there's just a lot happening, I think. And oftentimes it's behind the scenes and folks aren't really aware of it. But I do think that we're finally really starting to see the, the matchup of the eagerness upon the developers and the resources that are available start to sort of align, which is really exciting. Um, and so then to your question about more specifically for Oaklo, um, you know, we are really focused on, again, um, sort of the, the way that fast reactors can afford flexibility from a safeguards and security by design approach. Um, one example of this is the fact that, you know, our reactor is going to be able to run for a very long time without having to be refueled. So um, by that very nature, points of access to the fuel are very limited. So that's just one example of a characteristic of our reactor that helps us start to think about what um, sort of different, um, uh, I guess, implementation of safeguards verification um, and inspections might look like. Um, And then to Laura's point earlier, you know, we're very much aware that not only our reactor, but a lot of these reactors are going to require revisions to um, current approaches to things like safeguards and um, and specifically looking at fuel cycle. So we have a lot of governance updating to do when it comes to securing advanced fuel cycles, but we have the institutions in place to do this and to get it right right now as we are designing and demonstrating leading up to eventually deploying these on a, on a larger scale. Jackie, thank you so much um, for such a thoughtful answer. And before we close out um, this portion of the discussion on on fuel, I do want to pick up on one thing that Ken mentioned and give Kamala a chance um, to respond. So this notion of whether the mission of the VTR can be changed to produce plutonium, Kamal, can you um, close out this portion of the discussion and and give a quick response to that? Uh, Well, it is. uh 
if the question is related to whether or not we can run BTR in a breeder mode, in other words, in a mode where it produces more uh, plutonium uh, than uh, it consumes, uh, it will require a total change in the core design. And, and it, it uh, I mean, there are a lot of clever people uh, playing, uh, playing with neutrons. Uh, they may find some ways of uh, opti uh, optimizing these designs. But in my opinion, you cannot meet the high flux requirements uh, that we, because we rely a lot on those excess neutrons, which then you will have to use to produce more, pro uh, more plutonium on the blanket side of things. So it is not something that you can do uh, covertly. It, it, is, uh, it will require a, a major change in the design, a major change in the operations on how quickly you put fuels in and out of the reactor. So it is not something you would do. And in all honesty, there is no reason to do it. Uh, producing plutoniums for nefarious purposes you don't need breeder reactors for that. You can do that in any reactor. The amounts are so small that uh, you don't need to do the worry about this plutonium balance, whether you're consuming or you're increasing. And as far as I know, almost all the stockpiles in the world that are used in that purpose came not from fast reactors, uh, but from highly moderated uh, thermal reactors. So uh, the quick answer, uh, no, you would not change VTR2. There's no reason to change it. And if you did change it for some reason, it will be it will be fully transparent. Everyone will know about it. it you cannot run that reactor covertly as a breeder reactor. Great, thank you, Kamal. Um, Laura, you mentioned a moment ago the importance of international cooperation. And I wanna go back to you and ask you um, as a diplomat to talk a little bit more about why international civil nuclear cooperation matters and why it matters specifically as we're looking at the next generation of nuclear technologies. Well, the um, main reason comes from the quote that Ambassador Graham mentioned at the top of the conversation um, that countries, uh, you know, who are part of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty have the ability to, you know, have an opportunity, have access to the benefits of peaceful use, uh, peaceful nuclear technology. And so since most of them are not going to be developing that technology indigenously, uh, the most uh, simple, straightforward, uh, economical and efficient way for that access uh, to be provided is through international cooperation from that small set of countries uh, who have developed uh, those technologies themselves. The, so that's, that's thing one is the, you, there's really, it, it's a waste of time and energy for every country to independently invent nuclear energy. <laughs> um, the other point though, is that the international technology gives a chance for a country to impact the how another country uses nuclear energy and nuclear technology. And that comes through the, the training opportunities that can come along with that. It, can, it comes through the people-to-people -people engagement. It comes through the transmission, you know, kind of, in, of intangible knowledge about operational uh, effectiveness. Um, and it, it creates a, an opportunity to have an influence on the regulations, uh, the safety regulations, security regulations, and how, and it, how a country operates on, uh, you know, with its nuclear capability. So it, 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 that, that uh, influence can flow both to the positive and to the negative. Uh, obviously, from the U.S. perspective, we see our own uh, approach to nuclear energy as being, you know, second to none when it comes to safeguards and security, um, as well as operational excellence. Um, so countries that we cooperate with, we hope to be able to imbue with those same values uh, and implementation approaches. Countries that uh, with, who cooperate with other countries that are less 
uh, committed to those outcomes, uh, who, who may be less stringent about safety or security or nonproliferation uh, boundaries, can leave that mark on the countries with whom they cooperate. So that's why organizations like the Nuclear Suppliers Group, uh, like the International Atomic Energy Agency and the international standards setting that they, uh, and norm setting that they undertake, that's why those are so important to uh, be, you know, to raise the floor. That doesn't mean the U.S. Uh, shouldn't be aiming for the ceiling uh, and, you know, hoping for its counterparts and, and partners uh, to reach that level as well. But we also want to be working with other countries, even those that, with whom we're not, to whom we're not selling technologies, to really uh, raise the floor uh, of international standards and norms of behavior uh, on these safety, security, and, and nonproliferation aspects of nuclear energy. Thank you, Laura. And Ken, I'd like to go to you. Um, if you could briefly tell us kind of the flip side of that question, what happens if we don't succeed? Whether that means failing to deploy enough nuclear reactors to make a difference on climate, or whether we cede the global market to Russia and China on advanced nuclear technologies. Yeah, thanks, um, Jennifer. Briefly on the issue of clean energy, I mean, obviously you have in a number of major industrial countries, including the United States and South Korea, France, um, nuclear power providing over 50% of your zero carbon energy today. So those reactors are not going to last forever. They probably will get life extensions beyond what we currently think they're going to get uh, because I think their output is going to be essential for reaching this 2050 objective, but they're going to have to be replaced. So um, you're going to have to deploy these small reactors, obviously, in much larger uh, numbers um, to replace the output because their, out, their megawattage output is much smaller. But let me flip quickly to the issue of international. I mean, there is obviously a very clear challenge from Russia and from China in the uh, civil nuclear sector at the moment. And there are two critical issues that make that an important issue for US national security and international security. And the first, which we've been talking about a lot, is the fight for high standards of governance, especially as those standards evolve for these new technologies. Uh, and secondly, and something which has been a very strong motivator of this administration, is competing effectively on the technological innovation playing field. Um, you know, the United States uh, is not at the top of the nuclear pyramid at the moment. In fact, it's pretty far down the pyramid. So this is not a question of the U.S. should do X or the U.S. should do Y or the U.S. should do Z. The U.S. doesn't have the capacity at the moment to dictate to anyone. The Russians and the Chinese are driving the market and they're driving the, the um, building of reactors at the moment. So um, the problem for third countries, export countries, is that both of those countries have an extremely transactional approach to uh, the export process. Whereas the United States and its, its allies have a much stronger commitment to nonproliferation and security and to building up the capacity inside those countries so that they can be partners in good nuclear governance um, going forward. But my fundamental point is if you're not on the playing field, you can't win the game. And so these reactors are something we need to get on the playing field with because at the moment we're not in the game. Um, and I'm not sure uh, that we're going to get there on large reactors uh, maybe in Eastern Europe to some degree, but I think as this century moves forward, this is where the game is going to be played and the United States needs to be um, a key element in it. Thanks, Ken. And Kamal, to use Ken's language, um, how does the VTR present opportunities for international cooperation on civil nuclear technologies? How does the VTR get us back into the game? Well, in terms of international collaborations, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the concept of the Holden reactor that we have used many years for safety uh, safety testing of light water reactor fuels that multiple countries basically participated in that. Uh, I view VTR is uh, used uh, being very similar to that for, for the international community that we can do experiments uh, in uh, VTR. 
that will uh, benefit the safety authorities all across the world, whoever uh, is interested in those uh, advanced fuels, especially for fast reactors. So international community uh, getting international uh, partners working with us uh, in designing experiments, uh, performing joint experiments, and analyzing the data that comes out of those experiments I, uh, is planned to be a very strong part of BTR operations uh, from the get-go. Because uh, let's just face it, if you can, if you can get this thing up and running, it's going to be the only one, uh, the only fast uh, neutron source in the Western world. And there will be a lot of our allies interested in working with us and doing experiments of interest to them. Uh, and the interesting uh, and the always nice thing about uh, owning that reactor would be that we can probably uh, come up with experiments that we are interested in, but we would like them to be interested in as well. Thank you, Kamal. And Jackie, I want to go back to you again quickly for the industry perspective here. What does international civil co nuclear cooperation mean for the advanced reactor industry? And why is this something that the industry is pursuing? Sure, I'll be, I'll be relatively quick here. Uh, I know we're short on time. Um, so I'll just, I'll speak to this um, first and foremost as uh, companies where we're looking, of course, to eventually export these technologies to, to a growing uh, global market for these technologies. Um, uh, you know, Third Way partnered with the Energy for Growth Hub last year to do an initial study of what that market for advanced nuclear could look like. Um, and it was really quite eye-popping to see the number of emerging markets that are interested in these technologies. Um, and I think it's important to note, um, and I can tell you that from Oakla's perspective, this is certainly, um, you know, the mission of the company is rooted in addressing climate change. Um, and when we look at sort of the, the markets um, and the applications for Oaklow's design and uh, for, for its future designs, we're really looking at sort of this tension um, that exists uh, for, for many countries, especially emerging markets, between um, reducing emissions to, to fight a climate crisis in many cases that they did not cause and the pursuit of economic growth, which requires resources to power that growth. Um, and so in, in many situations, in most situations right now, natural gas and coal remain the most plentiful and the cheapest ways to do this. Um, diesel in situations where you have a lot of applications for Oaklow's design um, for a small micro reactor. And so for us, I think our, our company in particular, but I think others, um, there is a real uh, sort of driver here to to begin early on engagement with uh, with especially with emerging markets um, uh, with the IA you know institutions like the IAEA um, and other international organizations um, and of course our our partner countries our allies that we've worked with on civilian nuclear technology for for many decades um, to to work together to help sort of tackle this um, this nexus that we're seeing. Um, so, so many of these uh, countries face um, around the world. Thank you, Jackie. And now that we're nearly out of time, I want to do one quick lightning round with each of our speakers. And I want to really talk about how we get from where we are right now to where we need to be, especially for going to reach net zero by 2050. So, Jackie, I'd like to start with you this time, since I know that the industry feels a great urgency in these issues. When you think about getting from where we are now to demonstration and then to commercialization, what are the, some things at the top of your policy wish list? And I should say to speakers, like 30 seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna just do this in three buckets to get it out pretty quickly in themes here. Um, so there's really three key areas that can help to cultivate that environment that's friendly to nuclear innovation um, and help Oklo obviously to thrive. So the first is creating an affordable and timely licensing process. Kamal touched on this earlier. Um, there's actually a few different pieces of current legislation moving through that could be helpful with this. Um, but at the end of the day, we really do um, need to continue the modernization of our, of our regulatory process and make sure that it's affordable and timely for these new designs. The second bucket is really easing that path for deployment. We absolutely are excited about demonstration, but we need to focus on also deployment. And so the financial incentives that have helped drive 
other clean energy technologies to market like renewables should also be available for carbon free nuclear power. And then finally, um, looking at ways to accelerate private investment. Um, competitive private investment is going to result in an advanced nuclear industry that can actually bring multiple products to market. And Congress can play a role um, in enabling uh, and sort of producing some of these tax incentives for early investors um, in climate technologies that can go a long way towards that. Great, thank you, Jackie. And Laura, I wanna to go to you. Based on your work, how do we reassure the public that nuclear energy technologies, and especially this next generation of nuclear reactors, are secure from a non-proliferation standpoint? Well, the first thing we need to do is to recognize that the nuclear energy industry has done a terrible job of communicating uh, to the public. And so we need to go back to, uh, well, not back to, but we need to look to modern techniques of science communications and, communi and community uh, engagement to be transparent, to understand and be specifically responsive to the concerns that are raised uh, by the by the community, both the neighbors of a potential facility or the broader um, you know civil society uh, organizations that that operate in this field. So transparency and skillful science informed communication. Uh, is the will be a key component of success here. Thank you, Laura. And Ken, I want to go to you. When we spoke last week, you said that you wanted to talk about the three C's, clean energy, competition with Russia and China, and commercialization. So in 30 seconds, how do we get from here to commercialization? Okay, I, I think that there's four basic points. One, you need to um, treat commercialization like a military procurement effort not like a scientific fascination with a novel technology approach. Two, this cannot, as Laura said, become another pump and dump government program where you pump in billions at the front end and then dump it because there are challenges or there are financing. This is the last hurrah for American nuclear. So you either make this work or go home. Three, sustained funding. I saw the budget, it's a little different than the Trump budget, um, I think they probably, for this type of reactor, need to show a little bit more commitment on the financial side. And then finally, I think there's an opportunity to turn the table on Russia and China by cultivating the market at the front end, getting a pre-commitment from countries to use U.S. technology, and then moving concurrently with the technology development and the training and the operation by U.S. vendors and the U.S. Uh, um, technical community to let these countries work through their ability to be able to operate these reactors safely for the long term. Thank you, Ken. And finally, Kamal, I want to go back to you because I think you've really made the case for why the VTR is integral to the success of the next generation of nuclear energy technologies. So given that, what would be the most helpful in moving from where we are now to where we need to be so that the VTR truly can support that next generation? Well, the, the most important thing for VTR uh, and can touch uh, on this is a long-term commitment. This kind of uh, this kind of uh, efforts does not happen overnight. They are not one year, two year effort. And a long-term commitment uh, for VTR, a commitment that we are going to finish the uh, project and we are going to have it in place by such and such date. And, and we will have the, the, the yearly appropriations uh, consistent with that is uh, what we need. With that, we can do it. With that, uh, we can convince uh, the commercial sector that this capability will be available for you so they can start looking into their innovative designs and start investing into that. We can convince our international partners that we are serious so they can rely on us to have that capability and they can start uh, working with us. And uh, until today, I didn't think about it, but we can convince NNSA that we are gonna get, uh, we are gonna commit it to getting rid of that plutonium and that uh, we are not gonna interfere with the plutonium issue, run fi uh, five years and then uh, decide that no, we are not gonna do VTR, therefore now they, they have to deal with it again. Thank you, Kamal. So we are now over time, but this has been a fa fascinating conversation. And I want to give a special thanks to Ambassador Tom Graham, 
And thank you as well to all of our panelists, Ambassador Laura Holgate, Jackie Kempfer, Ken Luongo, and Dr. Kamal Pasha Mahmoudolu. Thank you to our audience for your interest and engagement with this topic. And thank you as well to Laura Sheely, Communications Director for the Versatile Test Reactor at Idaho National Laboratory, and to Karen Heinold of Clear Strategy Partners for their tireless work on this event. As always, I want to thank Ambassador Richard Morningstar and Randy Bell for deciding three years ago that the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council needed a nuclear energy policy portfolio, which I am very honored to lead. Thank you to my colleagues, Emily Burlinghouse, Laura Macedo, and Roger Morales. Stay safe and well, and I hope to see you all again very soon.